Good evening and welcome to Community Conversations sponsored by Schneck Foundation. My name is Laura Kirtley. I am the board chair of Schneck Foundation and am excited to moderate tonight's webinar. It's hard to believe that uh, we are just shy of the one year mark of when the World Health Organization declared COVID-19 a global pandemic. I actually remember where I was when I heard the news and to be honest, I remember uh, feeling a lot of stress, uh, some worry and fear. And I would say to some extent, I still have those feelings. But fortunately, uh, here in this community, we have had Schneck Medical Center take the lead in coordinating efforts to combat COVID-19 by providing education, uh, partnering with other organizations to provide access to free COVID testing, and sponsoring things like vaccination sites to help those in the community keep safe and informed. All of this is happening while providing safe, high quality care for our communities. This virtual presentation tonight is yet another platform utilized by Schneck's leadership team to push out to the community both factual and trustworthy information. Tonight, you will hear from expert panelists from Schneck Medical Center who will discuss up-to-date information in regards to COVID-19 from their specific role in the organization and in the ongoing battle. In addition, they have agreed to take questions from the audience following their presentations. So before we begin tonight the discussion, I have a few housekeeping items for our attendees. In this recorded webinar, only those speaking will have their microphones on. The audience's microphones are automatically muted. Following the panelists' discussions, there will be an opportunity for a question and answer session. At that time, the attendees may type questions at the bottom of their screen by clicking the Q&A function. Those typed and submitted questions will be sent in queue to me, and I will then ask the panelists to respond. Thank you again for joining us, and now let's meet tonight's panelists. The first introduction tonight is Dr. Christopher Bunce, who is a fellowship trained infectious disease specialist. He currently serves as both an infectious disease specialist at Schneck Medical Center and the health officer for Jackson County. Also with us tonight is Dr. Ryan Stone, who is the chief medical officer at Schneck Medical Center and serves as a hospitalist specializing in both internal medicine and pediatrics. Finally, our third panelist is Dr. Eric Fish, who is the president and CEO of Schneck Medical Center, having taken the helm in August of 2020. We are very fortunate to have him in this role and grateful to have him kick off our discussion tonight by providing hospital updates for our community. Dr. Fish. Thank you, Laura. Um, I just want to thank everyone for being on the call this evening for the foundation of uh, organizing this and, and Dr. Bunce and Dr. Stone for taking time out of their evening to, as Laura said, provide up-to-date factual information uh, on COVID-19 as well as the vaccine and the treatment options and, 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 and of such. Uh, as Laura said, it's hard to believe it's been nearly a year since COVID uh, appeared within our state, within our community. And uh, it's been a long year. Uh, it's been a difficult year for everyone uh, within our community uh, and within our healthcare system. Um, but, you know, I just could not be more proud of how our team members at Schneck uh, and our community has responded uh, to this pandemic. Um, you know, early on, uh, things were changing uh, by the hour, or by the minute. Uh, I know at the hospital, we began in, uh, in March of restricting visitors and shutting down entrances. Um, and, and probably one of the hardest things we had to do was restrict visitors uh, because how, how important visitors are uh, to patients when they're in a hospital. 
And those are decisions we did not take lightly and still today don't take lightly. Um, as that is, um, you know, we've had loved ones um, pass away um, without their family by their side. And, that, and, that's, and that is a very tough uh, situation, especially on our staff. But, but our staff has responded uh, very strongly. Uh, it's been very, very exciting for me as, uh, in my seat to watch how uh, our staff have bound together and uh, got through this. Uh, there, were, there have been some situations where um, our staffing was low due to COVID uh, that uh, we had patients, um, you know, pretty much at capacity. And we had staff jumping and helping others uh, and bonding together to, uh, to get through this as a community. And so that's, that's been something that has been very warming to me as the, uh, as the president and CEO of the organization. I think the other thing has been very good is um, what Schneck has done is what we should do. We should be the leader in the community uh, on healthcare and healthcare issues. And I think we've risen to that occasion. And I know uh, Dr. Bunce and I, uh, early on in um, April, May, began having community calls uh, whereby we brought the school systems, uh, the churches, industry, a uh, number of employers, uh, the county, uh, North Vernon uh, mayor's office, the Vernon mayor's office uh, on a weekly update. And we were able to disseminate information exactly what was happening in the community and get information to these organizations, to these groups uh, that helped, uh, I think, guide individuals and guide employers through uh, the COVID-19 situation. We're still doing those. We did take a little break early uh, in the fall because numbers began to drop. But as uh, things came back in October and November, uh, we did kick those back up. Now we're about to, about every two weeks now. Uh, but it's been a really good uh, way to share information uh, and get updates uh, to our uh, to our community. Um, you know, as I said, we've been very fortunate uh, with our staff, uh, our respiratory staff, our nursing staff, uh, our physicians, our hospitalists, uh, our county health department, uh, all working together to get through this. And I, and I think that's what makes a small community uh, as like ours as good as it is. Um, and because we can rely on each other to get through this. And, you know, I think I know I feel very fortunate. And I know Ryan would say Dr. Stone would say the same thing. Uh, I don't think people recognize uh, what we have in having Dr. Bunce in our community. Uh, he is one of the well, most well-respected infectious disease physicians, uh, not only in the state, but around. And we have him as our county health department and, and a physician on staff. And I know the hospital is used and have used uh, tremendously. So, you know, we've been very fortunate to have, to have him here. So, you know, kind of where we're at right now today, uh, we're seeing decrease in numbers uh, as we've seen across the state. Uh, it's concerning in some, it's, it's a great thing, but also concerning because, you know, uh, the hope is that we don't let our guard down because I think the community, the state has done a good job, um, you know, because of the early on, it, it's a new situation. Uh, there's all kinds of misinformation out there and frustrations, uh, but we've but we're moving in the right direction. I think this morning uh, we had five patients in the house with COVID. Uh, so that's, um, it's unfortunate for those five, but from a, from where we've been over the last couple months, that's a, that's a market improvement. Over the last month or so, we began vaccinating patients. Uh, that has been uh, well, very well received. Uh, the health department has done a fabulous job. Our team at Schneck has done a fabulous job. Um, you know, I'd be remiss not to um, show my appreciation for Columbus Regional and taking on a, being a 1A site early on uh, during all of this and vaccinating a lot of our healthcare care workers. Uh, so uh, we continue to do that. And that's been good. Um, and I know Dr. Stone will talk a lot about the therapies and, and, and the monoclonal antibodies and that. And I'll leave that to him. But uh, all those things are continuing. We're beginning to roll back our visitor restrictions, as most of you have probably seen on social media or in the paper. Um, we begin to open up and allow more visitors into our facility, uh, which is a good thing uh, because our patients need to have their families by their side uh, in, in the, when they're in the hospital. So, um, you know, I, I guess I just want to close by just to continue to encourage our community and, and our members 
uh, to continue to follow that same thing we've heard for the last nine or 10 months of socially distancing, uh, wearing our mask, you know, washing our hands and, and, and keeping, keeping each other safe. And it's really about uh, keeping your buddy safe and, and, um, and doing the things that, that we need to do con to continue to combat this. We are moving in the right direction. Um, so, which is, which is a much, um, much that needed thing for our community and for our country. So uh, again, I just want to say thank you for all of you who have joined. Uh, I know it's been a long year. I appreciate everyone's flexibility and patience as we move through this um, because, uh, you know, none of us, I guess, have ever been through a pandemic. And, uh, but I think uh, we're getting there and we'll continue to move in the right direction. So I want to turn it over to Dr. Stone at this point. Ryan. Hi. Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Fish, and uh, thank you to the foundation for uh, organizing this webinar and uh, giving us a, an opportunity to uh, speak with you guys tonight. Um, as Laura said, uh, kind of kicking things off, it's it's been a long year, um, and we've we've kind of come uh, a long way. If you'll remember, um, back in uh, January of 2020, that's when the first case uh, was uh, diagnosed here in the United States, um, and. Uh, I stepped into uh, the CMO role at, uh, on the 1st of March of 2020, um, and little did I know that um, about uh, four or five days later, um, we'd have our first case of COVID in the state of Indiana, and we really kind of kicked it into high gear at that time, uh, looking at uh, protocols and what we were going to be doing to take care of our community and the patients that we were going to uh, undoubtedly see, um, and that first patient... Um, uh, came into to Schneck on March 14th of last year. So just uh, almost a, a year ago um, uh, and, and about a week or so. Um, and since then, it's been uh, a whirlwind. Uh, we have seen um, uh, about 200, just over uh, 300 uh, cases of COVID-19 uh, since the beginning. Um, and so um, some of those have been very sick, requiring lots of care in the intensive care unit. Um, uh, all the way down to kind of mild cases that did require hospitalization. Um, so that, that's a um, pretty big feat for uh, a small hospital like uh, we have here in, uh, in Schneck. And uh, one of the things that I like to uh, tell my friends that live in the bigger cities is that um, I, I can still um, provide the, the big town, uh, big city medicine uh, here in our small rural community hospital. Um, and I think that's a, a powerful statement for what we've we've gone through in the last uh, year uh, with things. So, um, you know, we uh, peaked um, with with about three thirty one uh, patients in the uh, hospital at, at one time that were um, COVID positive. Um, and um, as Dr. Fish alluded to, we're down to five patients currently in the hospital um, at one time with COVID. So. Uh, that's a that's a big swing. Uh, the nice thing that currently we don't have anybody that is requiring any intensive care um, or um, uh, mechanical ventilation um, for their COVID. Um, that always can change at the drop of a hat, but um, we currently are lucky enough that um, all of our cases are currently kind of um, uh, moderately sick, so uh, not requiring um, the intensive care unit. So one of the questions that's been uh, asked of us is really kind of what, what happens when a patient is admitted uh, with COVID? And it really depends on how sick they are. Um, unfortunately, um, COVID, um, the COVID patients that I've seen as a hospitalist are typically those sicker patients that are requiring oxygen or uh, other respiratory support. Um, and so as we've kind of gone through the last year, you know, the, the research has rapidly kind of come through um, uh, as physicians across the nation and across the world have really been trying to fight this disease. And so our hospitalist team has done a fabulous job of really kind of staying on top of all of the research that's come out, really kind of vetted what we felt was most appropriate, both from the World Health Organization, the CDC, um, and our own individual um, uh, expertise and in looking at uh, the medical literature out there. And we have used Dr. Bunt's immensely. He's probably ready to throw his phone out the window multiple times since we, uh, we call him routine, routinely um, uh, to, to really kind of bounce ideas off of each other to, to really make sure that we're giving our community and our patients the best care possible. Most of the time when a patient comes into the hospital and requires hospitalization for COVID, um, we kind of have two main drugs that we're using to, to treat uh, the coronavirus. One is a steroid called dexamethasone, and that medicine we're using to 
trying to decrease the inflammatory response that the body sees because of COVID. Um, and uh, that medication uh, can be transitioned to a pill form um, and, and discharged uh, with a patient if they're uh, stable enough to do so. The second medication that is very common that we're using is remdesivir. Um, it's an antiviral medication that actually, um, uh, Dr. Bunce can correct me if I'm uh, wrong about this, but was initially uh, made for the fight against Ebola um, um, a couple of years ago. Um, and in early on in the, the COVID fight um, was looked at as a, a potential um, uh, player in, in the treatment. And we felt that um, uh, it was something that we wanted to incorporate into our, our treatment plan. And so um, we have continued that um, uh, uh, through uh, this whole year. Um, in addition to those medications, sometimes patients also need antibiotics. And so that's really just a case-by-case -case determination of whether or not the patient shows any signs of a bacterial infection um, that they would benefit from that um, uh, added medication. Um, it's not uncommon, unfortunately, to have uh, a severe case of uh, the coronavirus that causes um, one to be more susceptible to having a, a super infection on top of the coronavirus. And so that's when those patients would require that uh, antibiotic. Now, obviously, um, the, the reason that we get concerned about the coronavirus is because this usually affects um, uh, patients that already have other comorbidities or other sicknesses or illnesses that they chronically have. Um, that increases the chance for um, uh, uh, complications um, from the coronavirus. And unfortunately, that oftentimes means that these patients end up um, very sick from a respiratory standpoint, requiring um, high settings on oxygen, um, and ultimately um, I may end up leading to a, a mechanical ventilation or being put on the ventilator. Um, and so these patients, typically once they get to the point of needing uh, a ventilator, typically are on the ventilator for several days. Um, I think the longest that we had a patient on the, the ventilator was up to two weeks um, before we were able to kind of make some uh, adjustments. And so um, a very long stay for uh, patients that have been on the, uh, the ventilator. Again, thankfully, we are currently in a, a downward trend um, that we don't have anybody currently needing those uh, intensive services um, and are just currently re uh, requiring a mild amount of oxygen um, and the remdesivir and dexamethasone um, uh, treatments. Um, you may have heard um, in, in the news and, and talked with other folks um, about, you know, how does this affect pediatrics? I'm a pediatrician as well as an internal medicine doctor, and uh, we have been lucky enough at Schneck that we haven't actually seen any pediatric patients come across that have uh, developed the, um, the concerning uh, response um, uh, known as um, multi-system inflammatory syndrome in kids, or MISC. Um, we certainly have had some children that have had the coronavirus, um, but luckily most of the cases that we've seen in pediatrics have been very, very mild uh, uh, symptoms. Most of the time it's um, no different than what we would see with kind of the common cold uh, symptoms. Now that's not to say that um, uh, that one uh, kid out there um, may not be the, the one that develops um, MISC, um, but it is very rare. Um, and in my um, reading of what um, my pediatric colleagues are seeing in their intensive care units, uh, from what I'm seeing in my adult ICU, it's very similar um, um, uh, inflammatory response. Um, and so um, it, it, it does seem to be a, a pretty um, a similar uh, inflammatory response between adults and kids in that severe uh, illness stage. Um, Dr. Uh, Fish had uh, spoke a little bit about the monoclonal antibody uh, therapy. And so um, um, in November, um, you heard a lot of talk about the monoclonal antibodies. Um, uh, that really stemmed from uh, when uh, President Trump uh, was hospitalized with uh, his uh, coronavirus. Um, he was given a, a monoclonal antibody called Regeneron. Um, and that really kind of increased the, the public awareness of that uh, treatment option. And uh, the end of November, the beginning of December is when that became available for uh, hospitals and uh, infusion centers to be able to um, uh, provide to patients. And again, we went back through the, the, um, the emergency use, use authorization, the research that's been out there, um, and felt like it was an appropriate medication that we 
um, would be able to provide to our, our patients. And so kind of the beginning of December, we started um, uh, treating patients based on the emergency use authorization. That meant that if your patient had um, oxygen requirement, required a hospitalization, um, or had an increased oxygen requirement from their baseline, they did not qualify for that medication. So that kind of complicated things a little bit. However, it now gave us an opportunity to treat patients that had more mild disease and hopefully decrease the chance of more complications that would lead us uh, to, to further hospitalizations down the road. Um, and I, I, I'm a firm believer, and I know Dr. Fish and I have had this conversation before, that we really believe that the, the use that we saw from uh, December and January of the monoclonal therapy really helped to decrease our hospitalization rate um, uh, at, at SNEC. Um, and so um, we have continued to do those um, uh, infusions. The infusion that we most commonly use at SNEC is called bamulibinab. That medication is um, uh, produced by Eli Lilly, um, so an Indiana company, um, and uh, it is a pretty uh, simple um, uh, procedure. Um, the patient has to be tested positive for COVID within um, uh, a 10 day period um, to be able to be eligible for that medication. They have to be uh, within certain age requirements or have other um, coexisting conditions uh, that qualifies them for that medication. Once they're qualified for that medication and they're symptomatic, um, not requiring hospital stay, um, then we can uh, get them scheduled in our infusion center uh, for that medication. It's about a 15 minute uh, infusion at this point. Um, the whole process kind of start to finish when the, the patient shows up is about an hour to two hours um, to get the medication, or, sorry, get registered, get the medication, and then we have to do about an hour worth of um, uh, follow-up or, or kind of watching for any um, um, adverse reactions or anything like that. Thankfully, we really haven't had any um, uh, significant uh, complications or reactions to the medication. Um, it's been pretty well tolerated. Um, there have been just a few uh, instances, uh, I think two that I'm aware of, that um, did require uh, uh, an ER visit uh, subsequent to that. Um, but it was those patients were also later on their course of uh, the coronavirus um, uh, in those particular cases. So um, the, the corona, the, sorry, the um, monoclonal therapies are certainly still available. Um, and we do encourage um, patients in the community that if you test positive for COVID, um, to discuss that with your um, primary care doctor um, uh, as a possible uh, treatment option for you to try to decrease the chance for further complications um, from the coronavirus. The last thing I want to kind of talk about um, uh, briefly um, that we're currently doing that uh, was also mentioned before is the COVID vaccine. Um, I'm a big vaccination uh, proponent. Um, I think that in, in all of medicine, I'm most impressed with vaccinations. And I think I share that uh, um, with Dr. Bunce. Um, I think that's one of the biggest things as a pediatrician um, that I can do to help protect my, my patients. Um, and in, this, in the current setting with the pandemic, um, this is one of the best things that I have prayed for um, to be able to help protect our communities. And we actually finally have that opportunity. Um, and so we have been um, very aggressively trying to get the vaccine out um, uh, at Schneck. I know the, the health department has been doing the same thing um, with the assistance of the Indiana State Health Department. We currently at Schneck have only been giving the Moderna vaccine. Um, that's what the, the state has been allotting uh, to us. Um, and so uh, we uh, continue to do that uh, at this point. Um, you'll note that the Johnson & Johnson uh, vaccine was just approved here in the last couple of days. Uh, we do anticipate that the uh, state will have some vaccine uh, from there. And there was just a, a recent announcement today um, about that and how the state kind of plans to use the, the Johnson & Johnson um, uh, vaccine um, it with some kind of mass um, uh, vaccination sites. Um, but the, the uh, how the vaccine works and the technology behind it, I'll let Dr. Um, Bunce kind of explain that a little bit better. Um, but we do um, kind of follow the, the guidelines that the NESA Health Department has put out on who actually qualifies for a vaccine. Um, so um, whatever the, the state health department is, is uh, publicizing for their um, encatchment area, we're currently at the age of 55 and above um, is the, the current um, um, uh, age cutoff. So um, we certainly encourage anybody that, that meets that criteria to, to sign up um, to, to be um, uh, vaccinated. The 
Last thing I want to talk about uh, briefly before I pass it off to uh, Dr. Bons is um, a lot of the stuff that I talked about can be very scary. Um, and, and we have seen um, as uh, physicians in our community um, that patients really have tried to not per, uh, follow up with their normal routine health maintenance um, uh, things. And, and we really want to encourage you that um, uh, we are open for business. We want to make sure that you are healthy. We want to join you in that um, uh, journey to health. Um, and we want to make sure that everybody's uh, staying up to date with their health maintenance. So if you know, you're know you scheduled to, to follow up with your primary care doctor or you haven't made that follow-up, um, please call and schedule that uh, as soon as possible. We want to make sure that um, this pandemic is not further um, impacting our health down the road. Um, so we want to make sure that everybody is um, uh, not delaying their, their care because of this. We, we're, we're in a good spot um, and we really need to make sure that we're uh, working towards um, uh, our better health uh, overall. So with that, um, I'll uh, pause and I'll um, uh, pass this off to Dr. Bunce. Well, thank you. I'd like to start by thanking the foundation for inviting me to this conversation tonight and sharing some information uh, with, with everyone who's interested in answering your questions. Um, uh, I'd like to start with a little bit of the public health, give you some numbers, um, and then transition into talking a little bit about the vaccine, and then finish up with a little bit of myth busting about uh, vaccination uh, that we're hearing in the community. Um, first of all, I'll start with the numbers. We've had about 4,650 cases in Jackson County and 67 deaths. Well, what does that mean? Well, you have to drill down to find out who's dying. And what we know about the deaths in, in our own county is that 98% of those are people uh, over the age of 60. And therefore that gives you some insight into why we're prioritizing vaccination the way we are. Um, the, the number for all of Indiana is about 93% uh, of all deaths are over the age of 60. So, you know, we're working with the state. Uh, sometimes we, we, we do get some complaints about you know, why can't we get vaccinated now? But these numbers have been very, very well thought out uh, with a lot of um, uh, ethical thinking going along with that as well. Um, the peak case rate occurred in early December in both the county and the state. Uh, um, the peak hospitalization and death rates were in mid-December. Um, and uh, you guys know that. Um, and uh, vaccination started on January 12th at the health department, January 26th at Schneck. We vaccinated 6,822 6, people have gotten at least one dose and 3,545 people are fully vaccinated. That's about 8% um, of the county, okay? That number, that's, that's good. We're starting to get there. When you add that together with people who've already been infected, um, we're starting to, to develop a little bit of, of, of immunity in the herd but we haven't reached herd immunity. We still have to be very, very cautious. We still, uh, there's still a lot of vulnerable people out there. And so you need to keep that in mind if you've been vaccinated and still uh, uh, follow recommendations. Um, so currently uh, our seven day positivity rate is down to 2.6%, which is wonderful. Hasn't been that way in a long time. Uh, that means uh, we're getting about 67 cases per 100,000 per week, another a number that's also going down. So we're in the blue zone right now, which means, what does that mean? We've done two consecutive weeks. So our advisory level is blue. So that just means that um, we can do a little bit more. Uh, we can start to see people, uh, more people can go to basketball games and all that using precautions, of course, but these, uh, these codes do signify that it is safer to do some things. Um, in summary, we've had a significant improvement in our pandemic conditions in Jackson County due to a combination of factors, including public health measures, compliance to those measures, and, and as, as Dr. Stone really pointed out, excellent management of acute illness by Schneck Medical Center. And by public health measures, I mean testing, isolation, quarantine, masking, distancing, and reduction in public and private gatherings. And I'm very proud of our community because, you know, we scratched our heads early on and thought, gosh, how can we get people to do things? But what's amazed me now is everywhere I go, people seem to be towing the line. And uh, you see masks in the supermarket. I know there are exceptions and there's always somebody complaining about them, but I, I am actually, where we stand right now, uh, people are still really doing what they need to do. 
uh, to keep us safe so that we can get more people vaccinated to protect us. And, 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 and I think we're really heading in a good direction, really are. Um, I'm gonna shift to vaccination a little bit. Uh, as Dr. Stone mentioned, we have three vaccines uh, that have been approved under an emergency use organization, EUA, it's called by the FDA. Uh, what does that mean? It means that the vaccines can be released, they can be used, but they're still technically being studied. That means there's more and more information. About 75 million Americans have gotten at least one dose. Um, about uh, 25 million people have gotten fully vaccinated. So that's a far cry from the two trials of 30,000 that started this out. So we are gathering oodles and oodles of safety data now. And what we're learning is these vaccines seem to be very, very safe. And we'll talk more about that in a minute. Um, the Pfizer and the Moderna vaccines are very similar. They're called messenger RNA vaccines. All they do is there's a little, little uh, lipid ball that goes in, it's a little injection. And what they do is it provides instructions. The cells in your body will make the spike protein. Your, your immune system reacts naturally to that. And you develop an immune reaction to a very critical part of the virus. Um, and uh, that allows you to, to, to be protected against the virus when you meet it in the real world. Um, so it's important is that you're not getting the virus. The virus is not even used to make the vaccine. It's just a tiny little molecule that teaches the body to do something that sets up a very natural immunologic uh, reaction. And that's the Pfizer and Moderna vaccines. Um, they are all for all purposes, they're equal. Um, they're equal in efficacy, about 95% effective. What does that mean? Uh, we hear uh, that number a lot, and I don't think a lot of people knows what, know what it means. It's the basically the reduction in likelihood that a vaccinated person or a group of people who are vaccinated will get the disease in the community. So uh, if you take two groups, vaccinated and unvaccinated, for every 100 people that are unvaccinated, that get the disease, only five people who are vaccinated will get the disease. So you're 20 times less likely to get the disease if you've been vaccinated by one of these vaccines. And that's amazing. That's a great, great number. It's a very potent vaccine. And uh, there's a lot of reason to be optimistic for those vaccines. Um, um, there are two doses. That's the disadvantage. You have a, a, a primer dose and a booster dose. That's just the way some vaccines are and just makes your immune response that much more robust after you get that second dose. Um, um, and uh, the, the side effects so far have been quite mild, including pain in the arm. Some people feel fatigued and get a little fever, but generally these are, have been very, very well tolerated uh, as my colleagues would probably vouch for that. Um, the uh, Johnson & Johnson vaccine, which has just uh, been given an EUA, um, is a different vaccine. Um, it does essentially the same thing is that it induces the body to make the spike protein. Um, it does it in a slightly different way. Um, and it's a much hard, it's a much more rugged vaccine in that it, it, it's, um, it's, it's a storage requirements are much more common like other vaccines. So um, it, it, it's uh, much easier to transport. It's, um, it's going to be very, very useful, and it's only one shot. Um, now, there have been some concerns because it's only been quoted as being 72% efficacious in the United States. That's still a darn good vaccine, and, um, but it's 86% effective in preventing severe disease, and in fact, no hospitalizations or deaths occurred in the vaccinated group. So that just tells you that you know, it's a very, very powerful vaccine, and it's gonna be particularly useful when we have to do mass vaccination with lots, you gotta line a lot of people up and give them one shot and you don't have to worry about that second shot. Some people say, well, I prefer 95% to 80, you know, 82%. Well, you know, if that's your concern, the people who are most vulnerable, as I said earlier, have already been vaccinated are getting the vaccine first. So most of the people in the older age groups which have the highest risk of death and hospitalization, in fact, make up almost all of the people who have death and hospitalization, are gonna be getting the other two vaccines just by virtue that they're first in line. 
So I think that the J&J vaccine is going to be great for all of the rest of us. And I, I think it's going to be a, a wonderful vaccine and it's going to kind of polish things off. So we'll see. The other ones are going to be continue to be used in general population, but we're going to have three vaccines. And I think that will uh, enable us to go a lot faster than we anticipated um, at the turn of the year. Um, I'm not going to go into any other real technical details on, on, on the vaccine. I can, I can answer some of those questions. Uh, I would like to talk about uh, some of the myths that are uh, uh, being um, oh, transmitted on social media and, and some anti-vaxxers and you know, those who um, uh, tend to recurrently uh, uh, um, uh, draw suspicion and doubt to vaccinations. But I, I put a little list here of the things that we're hearing. Um, COVID-19 vaccination causes COVID-19 infection. That is not true, okay? There is no way that this particular vaccine can cause an infection. It's not even a virus itself. It's just a tiny little piece of a virus. It can't cause the spike protein, causes no pathology in the body whatsoever. It just induces an immune reaction. Uh, COVID-19 uh, vaccine is not safe because it was rapidly developed and rapidly tested. I, I like to argue against this one by showing that this was a prioritized effort. All of these companies dropped what they were doing. So this was not, yes, it happened quickly in an unprecedented quickly way, but it happened in a concentrated way. And all of the, the usual trials, animals, phase one, phase two, phase three, that we do in all other medications and vaccines uh, were used uh, in, in this process. So. Um, the safety data continues to look really good. We don't ever stop collecting safety data on vaccines. And um, if there are any concerns, those are certainly uh, going to come to the fore. And right now, these vaccines look really good. Um, there are severe side effects. No, there are not. Um, there are a few well-publicized cases of people who've had anaphylactic reactions. But in general, these the side effects have been mild. Um, relatively common, but mild and um, easily tolerable and generally gone within 48 to 72 hours. Um, COVID-19 vaccinations reduce fertility or they cause miscarriage. Completely false, there's no evidence for this whatsoever. In fact, if you take natural COVID infection in pregnant women, there's no higher risk of miscarriage uh, uh, at all. And that's probably the best test we have. Pregnant women were uh, vaccinated in the trials, uh, not because they were included on purpose, but because you always have trials where women don't know that they're pregnant. And so far, no, no adverse reactions whatsoever. There's no effect on fertility. Um, COVID-19 can alter the DNA. No, it cannot. Uh, it doesn't do anything to your DNA. Uh, the Moderna and Pfizer vaccines do not even get into the nucleus of your cells. They don't do anything. All they do is use the machinery of the cell to produce a little protein that you react against. Um, COVID-19 vac vaccines were developed using fetal tissue. It's another one that's new to me, but apparently it's being, it's being talked about. No fetal tissue was used in any way in the development of any of these vaccines. And that is just a complete fact. Um, the vaccines contain harmful preservatives. Neither, neither, the, neither the Moderna no, no, nor the uh, uh, Pfizer vaccines uh, contain preservatives all, a, at all. Um, and of last, and my favorite of all is the microchip. Uh, uh, and uh, there are people and they come into our office and we, we've seen them, uh, they, they, they will talk about microchips still. And we, those are the ones we have the hardest time, um, uh, you know, uh, dissuading from, from their, 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 uh, their ideas, unfortunately, for obvious reasons. Anyway, those are my main thoughts, and I'm, I'm ready for questions. Hey, Chris, I knew that's how you're, you're in your basement <laughs> in your house because your microchip is in your arm. That's right. Yeah, I'm being, I'm a, I'm a, I'm being controlled. It was, <laughs> is, it, is, it, is it the Gates Foundation that's got me? That's, that's, right. <laughs> that's usually the same patients that have the cell phone in their hand that are telling you that they've yeah. been microchipped. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Thank you, doctors, actually, for sharing this important information. I think with the onslaught of news and information on the global pandemic, it can be challenging to know myths from facts in the general population. 
So we appreciate you helping us to understand what's happening and to kind of cut through the confusion. Um, if anyone in the audience at this time has a question that has not been answered during the webinar, please submit it now by typing your question using the Q&A function at the bottom of the screen. If the icons are not visible to you, you may need to hover over the lower part of your screen to locate the Q&A function. So please use this function and not the chat icon. There's a chat icon next to it, but we ask that you use the Q&A function. And I can see that we're gearing up already. And so I am going to uh, proceed with the questions. If I get the vaccine, can I be around everyone? Could I spread the virus or be a carrier? And do I still need to wear a mask? Dr. Bunce, would you answer that, please? Sure, I'd, I'd have to. If you get the vaccine, you should still wear a mask. Okay, we don't know enough about how well the vaccine prevents you from transmitting the virus. The chances are, if you're vaccinated, you will not only not get disease, but you will not transmit it to others. We just don't have all of that information yet. Some of the vaccines show some promising data, but we don't have enough to make definitive conclusions. So we're asking people to, even if they're fully vaccinated, to still take the precautions of wearing a mask, particularly when they go into a real crowded setting. I understand when, if you're gonna be with your family and your closest friends and you're, not va and, and you're all vaccinated, uh, that people are gonna let their guard down. But I still think that if you go to a basketball game, if you go to a restaurant, if you do all those things, you have to show, wear a, vac a, a mask to be careful. And actually you're still showing courtesy to other people who might be concerned if you're not wearing a mask. Thank you. Uh, one, another question that I've gotten is, can I get a vaccine in a county that I don't reside? Absolutely. You can get a vaccine in a state where you don't reside. You can get a vaccine anywhere in the country. You, you can get, there's no, there are no geographic barriers uh, to getting vaccinated. You do have to fulfill the criteria. And right now that's 55 and older uh, and or, or with medical conditions. Uh, so, so, um, uh, but, but you can go to another place. Yeah, if you're, it's, that's not a problem. Thank you. Is there a specific vaccine that might be best for people who have had COVID already and also the antibody therapy? Is the two dose vaccine best or should these patients seek the Johnson and Johnson vaccine? Well, that's an excellent question. Uh, first of all, if you've gotten the antibody, you should wait 90 days before you get vaccinated, okay? Secondly, there's very good data that's come out that if you have had COVID, you probably only need one dose of either the Moderna or the Pfizer vaccines. However, that is not official and it's not, uh, it's not something we recommend yet, but I think we're gonna be getting there fairly soon. Um, and if you only want vaccine, you can go at one, one shot, you can go ahead and get the J and J. So there's no known best vaccine for somebody who's had COVID. I think all three of them are going to be fine. You're going to get a good booster effect, uh, from any one of them. Uh, this question is for Dr. Bunce specifically. Um, what about the vaccine and its effect on any variants? Well, um, Right now, we think that the vaccine, it, the, all three vaccines are effective against all of the variants that we've come across. There may be reduced effectiveness, but still, since we've got a 95% effective vaccine, we've got a lot of cushion there. One of the reasons that everybody's very uh, enthusiastic about the J&J &J vaccine is that it performed particularly well in South Africa where this variant that seems to be more resistant to vaccination is occurring. It wasn't perfect, but it was still a really good vaccine for that variant. So um, we, we, uh, uh, we, we still think the vaccines are ahead of the curve. Uh, and the more people we get vaccinated faster, the less amount of virus there is in the community that's replicating and the lower the mutation rates are gonna be. So we won't see many more of these variants, hopefully. 
since the positivity rate is measured by how many cases there are per 100,000 people, how is that measured when there are populations lower than that? It's extrapolated. So there's a factor. We only have 45,000 people in our county, but we can do, still do a rate per 100,000 because we can convert the denominator to 100,000 and then convert the numerator to 100,000. It's just simple math. It's a way to um, equalize populations in different areas with a one factor. And a lot of disease and epidemiology is calculated on a per 100,000 person rate. Murder rates are done that way too, not to bring up a bad subject. Um, Dr. Bunce, do you think that we will need another dose of the vaccine in the fall of 2021? Uh, you know, I mean, if you're fully vaccinated now, uh, I would say I'm going to go out on a limb and say probably not, but I, I, I am, I am perfectly willing to be corrected on that matter. I'll, I'll kind of piggyback off of that. Um, yep. I, I certainly hope that we don't have to, uh, do a booster. The, the, the hope would be that we don't have to, but um, uh, it certainly um, w it wouldn't surprise me if we do have to do a, a booster in the in the fall. Um, so I think it'll be uh, interesting to see kind of what the data ends up showing us moving forward over the next couple of months um, if if we need to do that um, moving forward. But um, if we look at um, kind of influenza uh, H one N one, you know that that particular um, uh, vaccine was we ended up getting a booster that next year um, uh, with that if I if I remember correctly. Yeah, and we're getting it every year. I mean, yeah. we're getting H one N one boosters once a year now, so it's quite possible that that this vaccine will be a, a yearly recommendation, and every other year that we, we just don't know yet. Yeah. Okay. Dr. Fish, this will be for you. Uh, what can the community do to continue to support the Schneck staff who I assume are continuing to recover from the events of the past few months? We want to support as we did early on. Yeah, I, you know, I was remiss in that. I, you know, the community did a wonderful job of supporting our staff and um, kids writing chalk messages on um bringing in meals, people just donating meals. Um, I think Stone and I have laughed about the COVID-19 uh, weight gain that we might have had. For <laughs> uh, no, it, it, it was very nice. And I think the one thing that is huge in the community support uh, that I've heard from our staff is to what Chris has mentioned. We see now people wearing masks. We see people socially distancing and doing those things. And I think, I think that is the as subtle as that can be, that is very powerful to the healthcare worker uh, who have been on that front line dealing with that. When they go to when they go to a store, or they go out in the community, and somebody is complete disregard for the disease that they have been caring for um, day in and day out, and been that love that been that patient's family. Um, you know, I, I heard that a lot as I've walked the floors of our staff being angry when they've gone out uh, early on and say, you know, people don't think this is real. So I think what we have as a community have done and, and have adopted the, the masks and, and that, and it's so much better today than it was months ago, uh, I think is a, is a huge subtle way to support uh, our healthcare workers. Um, you know, I think anything that any, any support, any, um, just any act of kindness uh, is always well appreciated uh, by any of them. And I don't, Ryan, if you have, you know, you, you're in the ICU and dealing with respiratory and the floor even more. So. Yeah, I, I can't agree more. The, the, the simple act of, of following the, the guidance that we're putting out with social distancing and, and wearing a mask, um, that, that, that's a huge thing for our, our um our providers and our, our nursing staff, our respiratory therapists that have been in this fight from the, from day one. Um, and, you know, I, I think the, the community support 
from the beginning has, has been tremendous. I mean, like Dr. Fish said, the, the amount of stuff that has been brought in and uh, donated has just been uh, immense. Um, but I'll tell you the thing that probably gets talked about just as much are the little notes that we get, um, the coloring pages from uh, the classrooms in the, in the community. And um, I mean, I just got, got a, a, a Valentine's card from uh, a classroom and, and just those little things um, get talked about just as much as, uh, uh, and maybe sometimes even more than the, than the food products and the, and that kind of stuff. So any of those kind of little things would be greatly appreciated. Thank you. Um, this question I'm going to throw out, this is a big question here, and I'm not sure who would like to answer this, but, uh, you talked a lot about the physical impacts of the disease COVID-19. What about the mental impacts of the disease? We are seeing an increase in people with overwhelming anxiety and depression. Has Schneck thought about how they can work with community leaders to help people who are almost paralyzed by fear to start to re-engage? No, I'll start um, on part of this. Laura is absolutely, and I think uh, the mental aspect for, it has been as, as, as big of an impact uh, on the community uh, as the physical aspect, and especially for for those who haven't had COVID and just the pure fear of getting it. And we've, I know being on the vaccine clinic and just seeing the, you know, the 70 or 80 year old individual come out and say, I just haven't done anything. And, and you know, just that takes its toll. So uh, we are at Schneck are working on a program currently right now for our own staff and our members, team members, uh, of how to deal with that uh, and, and of what they've had to face. And, and uh, some of this has very been very traumatic for our staff. Uh, and, and, and so how do they cope with that using our mental health department, Dr. Spurgeon and, and uh, um, Dr. Bannister. And, you know, I, I, I foresee us rolling more and more of that out to the community. Like we, you know, we're here to share the information as we have done over the last eight to nine months. Uh, I, I would fully expect we will do that with this uh, because that is an important thing. Um, the, the fear is still very uh, prevalent uh, out there. Uh, but um, yeah, that, that is something we are currently doing. And, uh, um, you know, I think one of the great things of COVID is as hard as that said, it's sad, as bad as that probably sounds is telemedicine. And we've been able to uh, take telemedicine now with our mental health department and probably our largest usage of telemedicine at Schneck is our mental health department. So people can get access mm -hmm. at home, not having to get out in the community, uh, in a waiting room, uh, to, to use that. So, uh, that is something we've also continued to promote is the, the use of the, the mental health um, departments, as well as our primary care can still do our telemedicine visits. Uh, so uh, if there's one good thing to me that's come out of uh, COVID, that is uh, the accelerated usage of telemedicine um, for things like mental health and, uh, and such. Ryan, do you have any thoughts on any of that? Yeah, I mean, I, I'm... I'm I'm so glad that this uh, question was asked because I think this is something that we don't um, necessarily talk about a lot, or you don't see a lot of uh, conversation happening about this in the in the uh, public media. Uh, but we have certainly seen this um, uh, on the inpatient side, and I know our primary care doctors are seeing the same uh, difficulties um, out there. And so um, I certainly um, uh, want to make sure that we are helping the community and and facing that fear and trying to um, debunk some of the, the myths and um, scare tactics that have been put in place um, by um, 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 uh, influencers and that kind of stuff. And I think that's what this webinar is, is a, a great forum to be able to help do that. Um, and I, I certainly think that, you know, as we get closer to being able to open up more things, um, when people start to to see that they can go to church um, uh, more freely, that they can gather with their family more freely, um, that they can do those normal activities um, that they're more used to, to doing um, and do them safe in a protected way after they have the vaccine and that kind of thing. Um, I think that 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 is gonna be a huge um, jump forward um, back into to normalcy. Um, I, I think if there are, 
um, thoughts out there of, you know, where people in the community see that we may be able to plug in. I would love to, to, to hear those recommendations to, to um, you know, help to, um, um, you know, spur some of that, because I, I do think that that's going to be a big thing moving forward in the next couple of months um, uh, as we kind of move forward. Thank you, Dr. Stone. Um, we have about four minutes left in our webinar tonight. It's gone very quickly. Um, I have one last question and I'd like to pose it to all three of the panelists. Um, if there's one thing that uh, you would like the attendees to take away from this webinar tonight, what would that be? And I'll start with you, Dr. Fish. Um, you know, I, I think probably for me, the biggest thing through this whole thing is take care of your neighbor. Uh, protect, protect your neighbor, wear your mask, not for your, necessarily for yourself. Uh, get your vaccine for yourself, but also for your, for your, for your neighbor. And, uh, and I think that's the one thing that, um, you know, we, we continue to, to work together as a community, as a country, to bind together, uh, to protect each other. Um, and, you know, seek us out. Uh, we're always available at, at, at the hospital. Our physicians are um, very easy to get access to. Uh, get, get strong, get, get true information. Uh, and don't, uh, um, as I used to always tell patients, stay off of social media. Um, because uh, uh, most of the time on there, you don't know who's putting things on there. So if you need the facts, let us know. We'll be happy to get it. But uh, I think most importantly, take care of your friend, take care of your buddy, take care of your family member and, and protect each other. Dr. Stone? Uh, yeah, so um, since the beginning of the pandemic and I'm uh, taking over as CMO, every time I sign my email, I've always said stay, stay safe and stay healthy. And I think the way to do that is uh, following the guidance that we're putting out there, uh, maintaining that social distance, washing your hands frequently, um, and wearing your mask um, uh, uh, as instructed. Um, and now that the vaccine is widely available, um, getting in line to get, get your vaccine, um, just as Dr. Bish said, to, to really take care of each other and um, uh, bring our community through this. Dr. Bunce, would you like to add anything to that? Wow, they stole all the thunder there. I, so I told <laughs> them to say one thing and they just well, I, I would quit. say, you know, I would agree. <laughs> it's the power of community cooperation, all this masking and vaccination and distancing. It's not just about yourself. It's about everyone around you. It's about your neighbor, about your family. And I think we've learned a very valuable lesson here. And every time someone says, well, I don't want a mask or I don't want to get it. I don't need a vaccine. Well, you're, you're doing these things for other people, not just yourself. And I really think the community has responded to that message. And I, look, we're in blue right now, not because of the vaccine. We're in blue because of how we all have worked together. And, and, and you just see it all around in Jackson County right now. I mean, it, it, it is remarkable. I don't think in our lifetimes we're ever gonna have another time where we, see, where we are, have the, 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 the um, opportunity to work together as a community um, so thoroughly as we have in this uh, particular pandemic. So I, I just think it's something we should all be proud of. Let's keep it up um, because uh, that's the only way we're gonna keep the lid on all of this. And, uh, but that, those are my thoughts. Thank you so much. I'd like to take the opportunity to once again, thank our panelists uh, for their time and their willingness to share uh, their knowledge and educate us with reliable, dependable, trustworthy information. Uh, thank you to the attendees for your participation as well. Um, Dr. Fish, you have about 10 seconds. If there's anything else you'd like to share with the group before we close our meeting. He's good to yeah, go. I just want to say thanks to Ryan. Thanks to Chris for their time tonight. For their time tonight. Uh, and thank you all for joining. And uh, like I said, and I, and I say every Tuesday on the call, please reach out if there's any questions or anything you all need to, uh, for anything, and especially around COVID-19 to help get us through this. So. Thanks, Laura, for the, and the foundation for, for hosting this event. You're welcome. So from Schneck Foundation, thank you for all for joining us tonight in our virtual presentation as we embrace the mission, Caring Together. Good night.